So let's talk about these professional ethics. Now, it's going to be very important for your CISSP to understand this code of professional ethics that we're going to cover. Uh, you're going to probably get some questions about this as far as the ethics for being a CISSP. And then we're going to talk a little bit about supporting your organization's code of ethics. Now, the preamble of the code of ethics for ISE squared says the safety and welfare of society and the common good duty to our principles and to each other requires that we adhere and be seen to adhere to the highest ethical standards of behavior. So we're going to do the right thing. We're going to make sure we practice what we preach as well. We don't want to just say, you need to be ethical. We need to prove to others that we are ethical in our computing habits when it comes to being a security professional. And we need to be seen to it here. So that goes back to don't just say what I, you know, do what I say, not what I do. We don't want to do that. We have to show people that we are following that. If you get asked a question about doing something that you think is unethical, let them know. I don't know how many times I've had friends or colleagues come up to me and say, you know, I, I, I'm trying to get in this email account. Can you help me out? Well, is it your email account? Why are you trying to get into it? Why did you forget your password? What about your secret? Qu I ask tons of questions. And eventually I'll probably get around to say, well, it's my ex's or it's a, it's a friend of mine or something. That's against the law. I can't help you out. I'm sorry. That's being ethical. You have to let them know. So again, I wasn't just saying, don't hack into other people's accounts. I was showing them that I'm trying not to hack into other people's accounts that don't belong to me or belong to anybody else. So strict adherence to this code is a condition of certification. Keep that in mind. When you go through your evaluation stage, after you pass your exam, because I know you're going to pass, after you pass your exam, you're going to have to get evaluated for your full certification. So this professional code of ethics is going to be important to you. So the canons of our ethics. Protect society, the common good, necessary public trust and confidence, and the infrastructure. We're going to act honorably, honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally. We're going to provide diligent and competent service to our principles and advance and protect the profession of what we do. So all four of those, and that's how we're going to go through this course also, by the way. This whole CISSP, we're going to try to follow this code of ethics. We're always trying to advance and protect our profession. When we're protecting that, that means we're not just letting everybody become CISSPs. That's how ISC squared is protecting our certification with the evaluation process. I'm not saying you're not super bright, or maybe you can make good guesses and go past the CISSP exam, but does that truly make you a CISSP? Does that make you part of the culture that makes up CISSP? Are you ethical enough? Can you adhere to these standards? Can you act honorably and honestly, justly, responsibly, and legally? Not a lot of people can say that, all right? This professional code of ethics it's, 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 uh, it's a very good code of ethics, but it could be hard to follow for some. So anyway, code of ethics, need to, you need to make sure you understand those. Put those in the back of your head when it comes to exam time. So when it comes to these code of ethics and supporting our organization, we're going to use those ethics to make our organization better. We want to look like we're strong. We want to be honorable and act legally. Remember we talked about the licensing, right? Licensing puts us in that legal category. So we want to develop a corporate guide to computer ethics for our organization. You know, we don't necessarily say, well, we're starting a business or I work in this organization. I am the security manager. I have my CISSP. Everybody's following the CISSP or the ISC squared code of ethics. Sometimes that doesn't fit. So we can develop a guide for computer ethics for our organization. Develop a computer ethics policy to supplement the computer security policy. Because I'm willing to bet you have a security policy in place, a computer security policy. Maybe we need to augment it a little bit. 
with these code of ethics. Add information about computer ethics to the employee handbook. Let it be known, okay? Don't just say, well, we had a code of ethics for computing and leave it at that. That goes back to the awareness user and training. We have to let our employees know that that information is there, what it means, how they follow it. If they don't understand it, be available to ask questions. Find out whether the organization has business ethics policy already in place. If they do, expand it to include computer ethics now. Why not? Why reinvent the wheel when you already have something in place? Also something that probably everybody is familiar with already, with your business policies. When to come into work, what the dress code is, when's lunch, how long are breaks, who do you report to, right? All business policies. Put some computer security policies in there as well. Learn more about computer ethics and, sp and spreading what is learned. Share your knowledge, right? We're promoting the profession, right? We want to expand that. Just because I'm a security professional doesn't mean I can't talk to this person over here that may be just an end user. Explain it to them, pique their interest, get them interested in security, let them know what's going on. You might get a, a really strong ally by spreading what's learned. Help foster awareness of computer ethics by participating in the computer ethics campaign. So don't just go to upper management or your IT lead and say, you know what, I took the CISSP, some really good stuff in here. Uh, this is, I think we need to implement this. So you, you, you have a computer uh, ethics policy and you slide that to your IT director and then you just go about your job. You do that, get involved with it. It was your baby, right? Get out there, promote it, walk around, hold up signs, I don't know. Let people know what's going on. Make sure the organization has an email privacy policy as well. So that way when you're blasting out emails, you always get that confidential statement at the bottom, right? This mail email is intended for the uh, person addressed in this email. If you're reading this and it's not addressed to you, you have the uh, legality to delete this email or something to that effect. All right, we're gonna have a privacy policy at the bottom. Make sure employees know what the email policy is, that everybody's following it, train them on it, have an awareness uh, program, have a, a training, summertime, end of the summer, around the holidays, something like that. Then we have security policies. We have policies that fall under security policy, standards, procedures, and guidelines. Now, policies. This is a document that defines the scope of the security that's needed by the organization, and it discusses the assets that need the protection. Then, uh, it's also gonna talk about the extent to which the security solutions should go to provide that protection. So, we're thinking about the scope of security that we need to protect our organization, what we have in our organization that needs protecting, and what we're going to do to protect those assets. And remember, an asset can be anything that's of importance to an organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be the computer, or a laptop, or the server down in the data center, or switches, or routers, or firewalls. It doesn't have to be hardware. It can be personnel. There are huge assets to corporations and organizations. Things can't get done without personnel. What about the data that we use? Right? We think about hackers, they're going after those assets all the time. They're not attacking our personnel necessarily. They're going after data, the good stuff, right? Remember those social security numbers, bank accounts, bank uh, credit card information, things like that. So we have to know in our policy, that's our assets. What are we doing to protect those assets? Do we have those technical controls like firewalls, IDSs, IPSs? Do we have policies in place to protect our employees? The security policy is an overview or generalization of the organization's security needs for what we need protect, protecting from. So we can think of protecting our data, protecting the building, protecting, like I said, our personnel, our equipment, our reputation. We're protecting everything. The security policy, kind of 10,000 foot view, if you will, of what needs to be protected, all of those assets. Policies also define the main security objectives and outlines the security framework of our organization, 
of what we're going to do. That framework that we talked about of we're going to do this to take care of this. We're going to do this to take care of this. And then in addition to that, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do it. This is who's responsible for doing this. So we may have the, you know, what and the how and the who of what's going to be taken care of when it comes to security. Policies identify the major functional areas of data processing, and it could clarify and define all relevant terminology. It's not a bad idea in a policy to put some type of glossary at the end. Because again, we usually help write these policies. We're pretty technical folks as security professionals. But if somebody, an end user that doesn't really know a lot of technical jargon, if they're going through the policy and they say, well, I don't really understand what this means right here. Have a glossary in the back. Let them be able to look the word up and learn, right? Or again, be available to answer any questions. And this policy should clearly define why security is important and what assets are the most valuable, the ones we can't really perform or function without. We're gonna talk about our business continuity plans and our business impact analysis. That's where we're gonna talk about our assets and which assets are critical to the business and which ones can we, we could probably do without for a little bit, right? Some personnel, most personnel, critical, right? Critical assets. But if a printer goes down, it may not be a critical asset. Our business, we're not gonna go out of business because of that. It's an inconvenience. It is an asset, but something has happened to it. But we can do without that for a little bit. You can't do without your personnel. You need people answering the phones, entering that data, taking care of your equipment. So what about standards? Standards and, and baselines. Now standards are specific, mandatory requirements that further define and support those high level policies. So for example, a standard may require the use of a specific technology, such as a minimum requirement for encryption, of sensitive products, maybe it says the standard is to use triple DES or AES. It also may go as far to specify the exact brand, product, or protocol that has to be implemented. So we may have a policy that says um, all remote access has to be encrypted. Okay, so now we have a standard that says for our remote access, the remote access protocol that has to be used to uh, protect our information, protect that privacy, is IPSEC. And I'm just examples here, right? So that could be a standard. Now, baselines are similar to and related to standards, but a baseline can be uh, useful for identifying a consistent basis for an organization's security architecture. Taking into account system specific parameters, because Sometimes, you know, this system may be a little different than this one. It may have some different parameters, like different operating systems. So after consistent baselines are established, now appropriate standards can be defined across the organization. So when you bring your business up or you meet the security posture that you feel like you want, you're going to set a baseline, right? And that baseline is usually something that we have to compare against. Uh, I used to baseline servers a lot when I started in IT, right? You, you get a new server uh, from the vendor, load your operating system on there, load all your applications, all your patches, antivirus, all your protection, right? And then let the server run for a few days. And I would baseline that server. I would look at the CPU usage, memory usage, uh, network utilization, hard drive utilization. I would see how hard it's working or how little it's not working. And I would look at that baseline. So now six months down the road, I'm getting calls. Hey, uh, things are running a little slow. This application is not running real fast. So what I can do is now take that baseline where, you know, says, so oh, okay, everything was about right here. But now all of a sudden I see a spike. You know, there's a spike for something. My CPU utilization has spiked out. So I can see that because I'm comparing it to the norm, the baseline. And I can say, oh, well, that's probably, you know, why we're, we're having some uh, latency issues. And then I can do further investigation, right? I can go look into logs and see what may be causing uh, the CPU utilization. But I'll use a baseline 
So I have that there for that consistent basis and I have something to compare it to. Now guidelines are similar to standards, but these guys function as recommendations rather than requirements. So an example, a guideline may uh, provide tips or recommendations for determining the sensitivity of a file and whether encryption is going to be required or not. So it's not a have to thing where you can get your wrist slapped uh, if you don't follow like a standard, you know, because standards are going to support our policies and policies are, that's it, that's the way things are done. This is a guideline, kind of like a recommendation, right? Um, procedures, these are really important when it comes to our policies because we can say uh, the policy says you have to do X, Y, and Z. Okay, great. But how do you perform X, Y, and Z? How do you accomplish the steps necessary to meet the policy? That's where procedures come in. They provide details and instructions on how to implement specific policies and meet the criteria defined in the standards that we're going to set. Now, procedures may include standard operating procedures, or SOP. You may have heard that in your organization before, you know. What is, what's, where's the SOP, right, the standard operating procedure? That's one of those things you usually read um, when you get hired on, or you should. Um, procedures may also include run books or user guides on how to do stuff. So a procedure may be a step-by-step -step guide for encrypting sensitive files by using specific software encryption products. So we may have a procedure for protecting your files uh, or, let's see, okay, we may have a procedure for digitally signing your emails. Policy says all emails need to be signed digitally signed, excuse me, with your private key, right? With your certificate. Well, how do you do that? If you're not a very technical person, right? You know how to do your job, but I've never digitally signed anything. How do I do that? That's when we go back and look at procedures. And depending on your organization and what software you're using, that's how the procedures are going to step those individuals through digitally signing their information, which gives us what, by the way? Non-repudiation, that's right. I know we haven't talked about that. I was just throwing a little, little test out there for you. So let's talk about this business continuity because we talked a little bit about it, but we need to look at it a little closer now. So the project scope and the plan of our business continuity and the business impact analysis. Remember, this that's the part we talked about with what we can't live without, what's critical to our business. So in a business continuity plan, there are some steps that we want to go through. First, we need to analyze our business. Assess the risks that we see throughout our business. You could be a risk analyst, and that's all you do. You could develop your strategy. Find out what you want to do to mitigate those risks. Develop your plan, right? So you, you take your strategy, and you start developing your plan of how you're going to implement your controls for risks. And then you want to rehearse your plan. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. So analyzing the business. First stage of the business continuity management life cycle is here because it's necessary to understand the outset exactly where your business is going to be vulnerable. So we need to know everything about the business. That's how we're analyzing it in the first place. So we're gonna go around and look for these weaknesses. Look for the risks. Say, well, you know, we do this, this is a high risk area. You know, this is a low risk area. So we're gonna go through and analyze the different methodologies that we use, the physical layouts that we have, physical locations, right? So we're gonna need the fullest possible understandings of the important processes inside of our organization between us and between our customers and our suppliers as well. So we need to get a holistic view, if you will, if I can use that term. We need to be able to see the big picture when we're analyzing this business and find out everything that it is that we need to know in order to help support um, lessening those risks. 
So after we do our analysis, we know we see the big picture, right? Now we want to assess the risks. So how likely is the risk to happen? So we're gonna look at this and say, well, that is a risk. Is it low risk? Is it high risk, medium risk, right? What effect would it have on our organization if something does happen? So if we're in certain uh, regions of the country, right, in the U.S., you know, if we're out on the East Coast or down towards, you know, Southern East Coast, we may be more prone to hurricanes. The Midwest, more prone to tornadoes, tornado activities. You know, the West Coast, they're always talking about earthquakes, the possibility of earthquakes out there. All those are risks. If we had buildings, say in the Midwest, how likely is a tornado gonna happen? Probably it depends on the time of year, right? I know right now, here in the middle of the, the year, uh, they're having quite a bit of outbreaks out there. Towards the fall, the East Coast and the Southern East Coast is prime hurricane season. So if we had a data center, say in Central Florida or on the East Coast of Georgia, or South Carolina for that matter, right? Could be, have a higher risk of hurricanes come through there, knock out the power, knock out our data center, flood the data center, right? May affect personnel. Hopefully there's no loss of life. It is possible. Because again, personnel are assets. What effect is all that gonna have on your organization? Well, loss of life is detrimental. A data center can be replaced. But if that's your only data center, now you may be out of business, right? You can't service your customers. You're not meeting those service level agreements now. So that is assessing the risks. Then we're gonna develop a strategy. So it doesn't matter whatever type of organization you are. We're gonna choose one of these following strategies. First, we're going to accept the risk, all right? We're not gonna change anything, all right? Everything will be fine. Uh, yep, I understand there may be an earthquake. I'm willing to accept that risk. Everything's fine. We can accept the risk with an arrangement for help after the incident. Uh, we can attempt to reduce the risk or mitigate that risk. Try to lessen it as much as we can. That's what we wanna do, right? I mean, if I know I'm in a high risk area for whatever, I wanna to try to lessen that risk as much as I can. Attempt to reduce the risk and make arrangements for help after the incident, or reduce all the risk to the point where you should not need any outside help. So we could have a couple of those strategies or one, or a mix of them actually, um, but you're probably gonna choose one of those. Usually we're attempting to reduce the risk then we're going to develop our plan. So once we've figured out what strategy we want to do, now we can put a plan in place. So con business continuity management plans will look for, uh, or the plans are going to look different for different organizations. All right, uh, depends on your organization. You know, if, 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 I, um, if I make cars or if I make candy bars, um, I have different needs, right? I have different importances when it comes to my organization. So my business continuity plan is gonna look a little different. But there are some key things in there that may be somewhat like alike. So for uh, an immediate, accurate, and measured response to emergency situations, that's what our business continuity plan should have. It should also provide policies and procedures and documentation needed to assist in any recovery processes. Remember, our business continuity plan is how we're getting the whole business back up. It's not necessarily a disaster recovery plan where normally we focus on the IT portion. Business continuity is how do we get back into business? How do we get our business back up to a level that is sufficient enough to maintain our standard, right, to meet our customers' needs? This business continuity plan should also provide a database and resources uh, available to aid in this recovery process an approved list of vendors that might be able to help out dur during this recovery process. You know, if, uh, if we know our data center is gonna go down, do we have server vendors, 
ready to go? Do we have that first line of we can call and say, you know, our data center went out in the northeast. They had a huge snowstorm. Uh, what can you do for me? I, I need some servers, right? Or electrical storm took out our, uh, our routers and our switches. You know, who can you call to get some more equipment ASAP? Should also provide needed documents and agreements required to reduce the outages, like service level agreements, to have those in place. So that business continuity plan, again, could be different uh, for different organizations as far as specifics, but as far as those five points, uh, they should all hit home pretty well. And rehearse the plan. Practice makes perfect, right? We can come up with the greatest business continuity plan of all time, but if we can't rehearse it, if we don't know what's gonna happen when the rubber meets the road, we may have some hiccups in there and we don't know it until we rehearse it. Now the business continuity plan is a living document, so we may only discover weaknesses when you put it into action. Rehearsal helps you confirm that your plan will be connected and robust if it's ever needed. Hopefully it's not. I don't wish any of these things I've said on any organization or any body, but things happen, right? We need to be prepared. Rehearsals are always, uh, also a good way of training your staff to have, us have those business continuity responsibilities. Because we have this plan in place and we say, well, we're gonna do this, this, and this. But if we didn't really talk about who is going to do that. So in that business continuity plan, we, we have people that are responsible for making those vendor calls, for example. I said, we can call them up. Well, who's calling them up? That's part of our business continuity plan. So rehearse the plan. You know, we, we do this, we've done it for years. When I was little, we did, you know, uh, fire drills in elementary school, right? We did the whole jumping out of the back of the bus thing and fire drills on the bus. You went out the front door, half of you went out the back door. We did that so we would know what to do in case of an emergency. Yeah, they could have come into the school when you were elementary or middle school and said, if there's a fire, everybody line up and go out that door. And we would have been, okay, and went on back with our studies. But they didn't do that. They came in, the teachers know the drill, right? So we rehearsed the plan. You would hear the fire alarm go off, everybody would line up, she would always grab her attendance book, and we would go single file out a particular door. And then we'd go so far away from the building and she would call roll. That was rehearsing the plan. Because in a real fire, it may not be quite that organized. You may see people upset. You may not be able to go out that door because there's a fire, so you have to go another way. So that's why we rehearse so there's not that panic. We don't want panic in our business continuity plan. It's going to be rough enough dealing with whatever situation is coming up. But when you throw panic and stress and worry all into uh, what is going on, you're only compounding on the issue. So in our business continuity plan, we wanna try to stay calm best we can and work through the problem. And as long as we've rehearsed it, hopefully, I'm not saying everything's perfect, we might not run into many, as many hiccups and we can have people fall in place on how they need to be.